Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I have a very special guest here. I met uh, a few weeks ago in an event down in San Diego County called Secret Knock. And um, uh, just actually unbeknownst to us, we schedule this for um, uh, today and without realizing it, that it's actually a very, very special day. My guest today is Claudia Wells. And you probably remember her from that little movie called Back to the Future. And today is actually Back to the Future Day. Uh, tell us about Back to the Future Day. What is, what is it? It's like an international holiday. October 21st, 2015 was in the time machine. So that was a place to go in 1985, um, the movie, the first movie. And it's just a huge, huge, big deal. And in fact, October 21st, 2015, I was invited to Australia, I was invited to New York, I was invited to Florida, to LA, because it's such a, an iconic day for fans. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty bad. The movie's now, it's in the Smithsonian. Isn't that amazing? And, and, which is just mind-boggling that, you know, that, that film is now in the Smithsonian. How did you get cast in that movie? What was, give us a little bit of the backstory. Okay, well, backstory would be, I screen tested for Gremlins, so it got down to me and um, the girl who got it and one other girl. I screen tested for Goonies. I screen tested for young Sherlock Holmes and they were all with the same company. So it was all one after the other and I didn't get each part. So it was all Fenton Feinberg casting. It was Judy mm -hmm. Taylor. It was uh, Frank Marshall and, and Kathleen Kennedy. So I was then told I'm auditioning for a Steven Spielberg movie. I went in. My first audition had Steven Spielberg, Bob Gale, Bob Zemeckis, Neil Kenton, mm. Kathleen Kennedy, Frank Marshall, Judy Taylor, Fenton, and Feinberg, mm. and a cameraman. And I, I was, and a guy who was on his 11th callback for Marty. And uh, he actually ended up being the drummer in the band scene in, in oh, the wow. first movie. So they gave me the scene that, um, Marty and Lorraine do in the car where she's smoking and drinking and they kiss that mm -hmm. and we did that um, again and again and again and then Stephen would say go outside and just do each other do do faster do faster and we would go back in and then he was asking me questions and he's like well do you smoke and I said you can't tell my mom if I tell you this you cannot tell my mom and he said do you have cigarettes with you and I said am I gonna get in trouble no. So he had me smoking and blowing smoke in his face. And um, <coughs> apparently his office was one of the first non-smoking offices ever. So I am probably the only person who ever smoked in that office. And then he was asking me, do you have a boyfriend? And I was super, super shy. And he kicked out the cameraman because he said, I can't have a camera here and not be the one taking care of it. And he no one else really talked. No one um, talked to the guy. It was just Stephen talking to me for about an hour and a half. I wow. was in there about an hour and a half, two hours. <coughs> and a few weeks later, I found out I got the part. One wow. audition. And like what went through your head when you got that part? You, you saw that, I mean, basically you have the history of my filmmaking involved in this one movie. I mean, how did you feel getting that part? I was like, wow. I got a Spielberg movie because I'd started in a lot of TV series at that point and episodics and movies of the week and commercials. And I did opera. I'd done a lot of everything, but I'd never done a feature film. So that was my first one that I got. And I almost got so many. Wow, that's amazing. So your first film is the one that's in the Smithsonian and it'll last forever. Isn't that amazing? That's pretty cool. Um, when when you were filming it, did you have any inkling that the film was going to be what it's become? Absolutely not. <laughs> Nobody did. Nobody did. I think I, I th when the four by four truck was there, if I remember right, I think Michael said if I, I remember it like he was saying if the film makes three hundred thousand, but he probably said if the film makes three million, I get that truck, mm -hmm. and everyone laughed. I mean, nobody. We just were working. And. On that crew, on that, that team and that cast, who were the most fun people to work with? Most fun? Yeah. Um, well, Michael was always fun. Interesting, outgoing, positive. Um, 
really nice. Uh, Christopher Lloyd was very shy and quiet. Really? And subdued and didn't talk much unless he wanted to. So fun, I'd say Michael. And I'd say at this point in life, I mean, James Tolkien and I are like great buddies. I'm his wingman, mm -hmm. Mr. Strickland. And, um, and Mayor Goldie Wilson and I are great friends and I dress him at my store. So it's changed throughout the years. And so now you're in this iconic <laughs> film and we're how many years later now? 36. We're 36 years later and it's still just, you know, this iconic thing. It's back on Netflix, I it's think. It's back again, on Netflix. And, Someone uh, told me that yesterday. And stuff. And you've been going out and um, well, participating in the Comic Cons and it's all amazing. of that. Uh, when did you start doing the Comic Cons and those kind of things? I think I started maybe in 2012. And I mean, before I go, I, I love emailing back and forth with Bob Gale. So I'll, I'll email him and say, I'm about to go to France. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Today I emailed him, happy Back to the Future Day. Um, I'm a meme, thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, it, it was a very strange experience for me at first doing the Comic-Con thing. Cause I felt like I was sort of selling myself mm -hmm. with the pictures and if I didn't have a really long line, I thought, well, uh-oh, I'm doing something wrong. It was just, I didn't like it. And then uh, the agent who had asked me to do it said, well, you got the pictures taken. Just, why don't we just do it until you're done with your pictures? And then I started looking at it more like a business, like I sell suits at my store. Mm -hmm. I sell pictures at a Comic-Con. And it's about the relationship between me and the fans. And about, like, what I can give to them because I mean there's like a, a 15 year old who said you've made my life <laughs> and and it's just so if I can bring joy to someone just by being there it's so heartwarming and fulfilling and <clears throat> when you get to these fans like what's the kind of the craziest fan story I mean you have to have a bunch of those oh, where... which one okay so I was in Australia and a guy came up um, with his wife and he wanted me to sign his body because he was going to get it tattooed. And I'm looking at his body and he's covered with tattoos except for right here. And I go, there's no place to, to do it. And he goes, find a space. And I said, well, I could do it like here. And he said, I want the I love you 5554823, which is so famous because it's on the back of the clock tower flyer. And it was my handwriting, which is so cool. So I said, are you sure you want my handwriting to say I love you on your chest for the rest of your life? What about, and the wife goes, I'm okay with it. <laughs> and, and so I wrote it, I love you, I, dear's his name, I love you, 5554823. I started running out of room, so I start writing up here, love Claudia Wells, Jennifer Parker, and then the next day, uh, um, the security people come up and they say there's there's someone who wants to see you and he says that he tattooed your writing on his body uh, we have him in the back we haven't let him in yet and I said no 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 let him in let him in and there's a picture and he's he's all red right here and it's tattooed and that's one of three people who have tattooed my writing on their bodies that's so crazy a young kid in Italy a young girl in um, at some East Coast show I did, who I've seen since, and her whole and her dad paid for it. She was twenty three. That's not so. How many of these shows a year have you, have you been doing? It depends on the year. In two thousand and fifteen, I just said yes to everything, and I was in. I I wore myself out. It was like one show after another: Japan, Chile, Australia, New York, Los Angeles, Florida, about three other states. Now, um, I do appearances, and where sometimes it's just me going to different places for a weekend. And um, I also do Comic-Cons. I was supposed to be in Ecuador in a couple of weeks, but they had to cancel because of COVID. COVID yeah. And Peru, they had to cancel because of COVID. But I'm leaving uh, next week for New Jersey for a restaurant opening on November 5th, and then a signing, and then a Q&A with the movie playing, and then... New Jersey. Uh, I'll be in Atlantic City November 12th, 13th, and 14th for the New Jersey Horror Con. 
So it's just, it, it's never ending. And I'm a traveler, so I mm. love it. Yeah. The, the movie is so iconic. I mean, is it top of mind to you? I mean, do you wake up every day and go, oh my God, I'm in like this movie that's gonna, you know, kind of go on forever? Or, you know, is it just kind of subdued or quieted down a little bit? Because you, ha you have a whole other life, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. It's kind of, uh, it changes depending on the day. So my assistant was at my apartment the other day because we're organizing. And in my dining area, I have like a table with all this stuff. And she said, why don't we put all the Back to the Future pictures here? And then when you get your fan mail, it'd be so much easier to get to the pictures. And I was like, I don't want Back to the Future in every room of my apartment because this is like my home. But we'll keep it in the office where the whole wall is different Jennifer Parker pictures for shows and things I do. Um, so it depends. Some days I'll wake up and be maybe lonely and then realize I've got 183,000 fans on Facebook. How can I be lonely? What would they say if they even knew that? And then other times I wake up and I praise God for the opportunity and the blessing and the, oh my gosh, it's like being in the Wizard of Oz or the Sound of Music. Right. So before we break, tell us about the t-shirt. Okay. It's How About a Ride t-shirt and Timothy Liu, who's a Back to the Future artist, painted it. I actually was sitting on the car. I did a speaking gig and the car was there and all of this stuff was here and I sat on it and I sent him a cell phone picture and said, could you turn me back into Jennifer? And so it's a how about a ride? You can get it at ClaudiaWells.com. Oh, wow. And um, it's got 12 colors in it. It's very soft cotton. Yeah, no, it's a great looking I've got it from small to double extra large. Great. Well, we're going to be back and talk about, uh, you know, Claudia's life uh, after the iconic movie. And uh, stay with us. Cut. Time? Uh, 12 minutes. Oh, good. That's a good one. Action. All right, we're back um, here with, with Claudia still, and uh, there's been so much controversy about that movie, I mean, you know, particularly in the casting phase. Um, you know, sometimes I don't know how much is true and it's not, but you were in the movie originally. Michael J. Fox wasn't in it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, give us that, that background. I was cast when Eric Stoltz, he got cast... I don't remember if it was after me or at the same time. And he and I would do, we did pictures at Universal. There's, they're online of the boyfriend, girlfriend pictures. And um, Amblin had us talk on the phone and meet to get a, a you know relationship going. And then I found out that off the rack that I starred in with Ed Asner and Eileen Brennan for ABC, mm. a pilot got picked up for a mid-season replacement. And then it was going to be shot three camera in front of a live audience at the same time as Amblin wanted me to do Jennifer Parker. And they wouldn't share me. So so there's been different casting things. So um, I had to stick to my original contract and back out of being Jennifer and Back to the Future. Wow. Originally. So then Eric shot for nine weeks. And for 20 years, none of us ever said anything was complete secret and he was let go because they wanted someone more comedic I mean I can't really speak for them but that's what people said and then I had already done all my shows the girl they cast my part to Melora Hardin she's actually on Dancing with the Stars mm -hmm. now is 5'7 I'm 5'3 and a half mm -hmm. they cast Michael who apparently was their first choice originally he's 5'4 so Melora got fired only because of her height. I got rehired because I was supposed to be Jennifer and I still got to do the movie. That, I mean, that's really, really funny because normally you have to say, oh, you were too short for you know, the movie. I mean, here is, you know, being, uh, you know, small and tiny uh, really came to, to help. So what was your feeling when, you know, they got rid of Eric and were bringing in Michael and stuff? Did you have any thoughts about that? Did you think it was a good move, bad move? I didn't. I was just happy to have my part back. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really looking at it. I took Stella Adler's acting class with Eric Stoltz when he first moved to L.A. from okay. Santa Barbara to be an actor. And Stella Adler was our instructor. So I knew Eric from all those years back. And I have um, 
incredible respect for his talent and his abilities. But as far as I was concerned, I was just happy to be Jennifer. Sure. Well, when did you know you wanted to be an actress? When I was born. Really? Since I could speak. Since I could, I looked at the television. I used to look, I just knew I was supposed to do that. And I used to cry to my mom and she'd say, why are you crying? And I said, mommy, I'll never be small enough to get on TV. And she goes, honey, those are real people. They're not that small. They're real people and it just looks small. And I was like, really? And then um, there was a show with inventors and there would be like three people who had invented things in front of a podium and they'd show their invention. So I actually invented something when I was like six and I showed my mom what I had invented, which was it's still not been done. I said, mommy, I want to be on that show now. I, I invented something. I can mm -hmm. be on it. And she said, no, honey, it's reruns. And I was like, so all I, all I ever wanted to be was an actress. Wow. That's amazing. So how old were you when you got your first paid gig? Eight. Wow. But what was it? It was in an opera at the San Francisco Opera House, um, at the current actually, because it was spring opera. My sister had gotten a part, a singing part to be in Werther for San Francisco Fall Opera. And I used to go to the dress rehearsals and I was like, you know, if I sing, I can be up there. I don't care if I'm acting or singing or what I have to do. I want to be on that stage. So I, I told everyone, I want to do what she's doing. I want to do that. I want to do that. And I bugged them, and then they called and said, well, we have a part for Claudia in La Mico Fritz. And I played the little girl. And I was ended up being in, I, got, I think I got $5 wow. performance. Okay. And I ended up being in 10 operas between the age of 8 and 12 at the San Francisco Opera House. So that was backstage at the Opera House with Placido and Luciano. And all, that was my home. Wow. And they used good. to all come over for dinner. And that was my home. And so how did you move from that into, so you did TV before film? Yes. So. I, okay, so I also, my mom got me an agent, Brebner, in San Francisco. She was like the, the agent. So I did a ton of modeling, like in the newspaper or in uh, JCPenney catalogs. Okay. So I did that, and that, I think that was like 60 an, uh, an hour, which we were shocked about. And I did a Volvo commercial, which won a Clio. That was my first television acting ever. And I spoke French. So when I went into the audition, they said, we want you to sing a song. And I sang Frère Jacques. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I got the part. And I, then I used that to talk my mom into, we have to move to Los Angeles. We just have to. And your mom just went along and did it? Well, my modeling agent in San Francisco at Grime came with my mom and I to L.A., to have generals with casting directors. And Tony Howard was one of them when she worked for Lynn Stallmaster. And I had a general with her. And then she called the agent a few months later and said, we have a part that we want Claudia to audition for. I was 11 mm. in Family. Do you remember that show with Sada sure. Thompson and Christy yeah. McNichol? So I, I went to LA and I did a cold reading, which is like my specialty. It's like my secret superpower. It's so easy. For, it just comes natural to me. And she said, very good. And she came out and talked to my mom and she said, Barbara, Claudia did a very good job. She's got the part. And I need you two to go into that room because I still have all those girls to audition. And there was like 20 little perfect actor mm. girls. And that's how it started. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you, you've got this whole other life that you've gone into, you know, outside of acting and stuff and in the business world and stuff. And that's what I want to talk about next. So we'll be right back. Cut. Time? Yeah. 19.06. Oh, good. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. exactly right. Cool. And now we'll talk about the store mm -hmm. whenever you're ready. All right. And action. Hi, we're, we're back with uh, Claudia again. And so, Claudia, uh, yeah, I had this iconic movie. But, you know, from what I know, you then, besides, you know, the entertainment business, you moved into the, the business world itself, the general world. Um, uh, you've had a store for 30 years here in Los December Angeles? December 19th is 30 years. I opened in 1991 when I was 25. That's amazing. What inspired you to do that? Why, why did you make that move? Specifically for two reasons. One, I wanted to go back to acting. 
But I knew if I go back to acting, I never wanted to be like hungry or desperate. I wanted to go back like I used to, where if a part's not right, I don't take it. Where if the money's not right, I don't do it. Just how I used to act. But I knew I couldn't do that unless I was financially able to take care of myself. So then I knew this guy who had a women's resale shop. Mm. And he used to walk around and go, oh, I wish I had something like this for, for men. There should be something like this for men. He's French Moroccan. Monsieur, I was called Monsieur. I said, well, Monsieur, let's open a store like this for men. But he didn't necessarily want a woman as a business partner. And mm. I'd never had a, a normal job before, and except for little odd jobs. And I was a very professional babysitter for over a decade. Um, so finally, we got together and his knowledge and I spent, I borrowed 5,000 from my dad that he didn't make me pay back. And we got the keys to a store on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City. And nine days later, we got the keys on seven days, eight days later, uh, keys on December 9th. And on December 19th, the store was open, fully done up, fully merchandised carpeting, painting. This man is a genius at opening stores. But he handled his women's store and I handled the men's store. And we had very different values mm -hmm. in terms of, I wanted it to be like a, an Italian boutique of the highest end clothing for men that you don't even know is resale until you're told. And so I bugged him because I wanted everything dry cleaned. I wanted it done properly. And um, so I bought him out after six months so it's been my store since 1991. Wow. That's and I, I didn't even know I had a business sense until <clears throat> I was negotiating. So that's how you've been dressing all kinds of people Everybody. from all walks of life. Yes. But, uh, you know, I want to get to the celebrity, the juicy celebrity stuff. I hear that you dress Roger Moore. I did. Tell me, I got to I gotta know that. Oh, I Tell love him, 007. I was hired to dress him for... Uh, an event that he was wearing a tuxedo at and I was so honored that I was the one hired to dress him so at, I brought some tuxedos and some tuxedo shirts from my store and he was staying at the penthouse of the Universal Hilton and at the time I was driving a 1979 Lincoln Continental designed by Pucci and it was turquoise and silver with a white leather interior and I'm driving up the hill to go to his penthouse and I ran out of gas <laughs> and I'm like I called the producer and I said, I said, I, I'm not there yet, but I'm close. I, I ran out of gas. Where are you? I'll pick you up. I said, well, I'm on the hill driveway leading to the hotel. And he came down in his convertible Rolls Royce Corniche. And I left my car there. I turned on the blinkers, jumped the fence, got in his car and just ignored it. And, and when I met Roger Moore, I was like, you know, I boycotted. James Bond when you stop doing it and he said well, you're a very smart young lady and then I um, I had this tuxedo shirt which the very high-end very expensive tuxedo shirts have this tail in the back that go under and through your legs and button on the top and I was explaining to him that the, this is a certain type of tuxedo shirt that I thought he would like and he said my darling I created that I invented that mm. in the 50s when I did a series that was uh, cowboys and I would jump off my horse. I wanted to make sure that my shirt was perfectly tucked in. So I created that. And then we got into this whole thing of um, I was too nervous to measure him. So for the, the tail thing, because he wanted another one. There was two other tuxedo shirts that, that didn't have that tail thing. Mm. And he wanted me to put it on. And I was like, I figured I could just guesstimate. So I took the shirt to my tailor and I said, I need you to put a tail like this. I said, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, maybe this long? And so she did it and I brought it and dropped it off and I got a phone call from him saying, Claudia, I don't know what you were thinking, but it goes down to my knees. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll be there in a few minutes. And I went back with my measuring tape and his perfect wife, who was like all in beige when I first met her, head to toe, just elite. And the producer were way in another room at this point. 
So I said, excuse me, Mr. Moore, can we, can we go somewhere private? And we went to like the front area and he's standing there and I was on my knees in front of him like this, closing my eyes with a measuring tape behind him and going to the front. And then I just laughed and I looked up and I said, can you imagine if your wife saw us right now? <laughs> that's, that's crazy. But these, these days, so the store itself is not open to the general public anymore. No. It's an appointment only. That is How does correct. someone get an appointment to come in the store? I mean, do you pick who comes? And No, but, uh, well, no. But if um, they go to ArmaniWells.com and they schedule... And if there's no availability, it's probably because I'm traveling or working. And when there is availability, they can schedule at their convenience, either to sell to me or to buy from me. And it's called a shopping experience because my store is really an experiential mm. thing. And it's not just clothes, even though the clothes are phenomenal. Sure. So what is what does a day look like for you now? I mean, what do you do now for fun, for life, for family? and you know, Phyllis said, other than the store oh, and that's a great question. movies, what, what, is, what drives you? Okay, so I've got three babies. I've got Tufi, who's 19. Wow. And I had her since she was like this big, little kitty. And then uh, all my babies are, are, they were homeless. And then, and Fairlyn. And then I've got uh, Goldie, who's my little mountain lion, and his sister Oreo. They're two. And I bottle fed them. For the, every three hours for the first month I had them because they were so tiny and now they're two. So my home life is my three babies and fun because I mean Goldie's like jumping and, and flying and then Oreo's all shy and then Toofy's the boss and really upset. What are these babies doing here? So my home life is me and my babies. Even though I have a baby but he's 26 and he's off and you know, gone in his life. Um, I'm very close with my sister, my full sister and her husband. So we do a Zoom twice a week. Wow. One is to just catch up with each other. One is to go over my budgeting because her husband's really good handling money. And um, I email with my dad and his wife. My dad's 96 and he's quite an astounding scientist, world renowned, a humble scientist. Um, Right now, I leave in the evening to go sleep with my Bahamian mommy because she's going through a hard time right now and she has to get up all throughout the night. Mm. And so I'm giving her daughter a break, who's my best friend. And so, I mean, my life is, it's not the, um, I don't know, I guess you couldn't really predict what I was going to say. Right. How, much, how much time are you doing, you know, these uh, book signings and picture signings and I do them at least uh, pretty much twice a month. Wow. And stuff. Easily, sometimes more. And you like them? I love them. I love people. I love tra I love everything about travel, even the airport. And just what 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 is it that you'd love to do that you haven't done yet? Write a book. Uh, travel to places I've never seen. Maybe get married. I've never been married. Okay. If my husband finds me and I'm infatuated <laughs> with him and I respect him and trust him and look up to him, then that's a potential life experience that I might have. Um, I wonder what country I'd end up living in. Like, I have no idea where I'm going to situate myself. I think I would like to live in a few different places, three months here, three months there, three mm. months here. Um, I write a ton of poetry, so I wouldn't mind speaking my poems at different places. I want to act. I want to act again. Okay. And um, just uh, what what got you to Secret Knock. We met at Secret Knock. Dr. Greg Reed's big event yes. and stuff. And it's such an eclectic group. Completely. There. How did you find out about it? How did you get invited? How did you get involved? My friend Butch Patrick, who was in the Munsters, okay. you know him. He yeah, played, sure. I don't remember the name of his character, the kid. Yeah. Uh, he called me one day and he said, there's this thing called Secret Knock. It's a think tank and I think you'd be good to be a speaker there. And I'm like, me at a think tank? I mean, I'm like secretly smart. No one knows I was private school and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
so he got me he got them in touch with me he said may i have your permission to give them your information and then they got in touch with me and hired me to do this three-day event that all i knew about it was it's some sort of a think tank with interesting people the um, founder of uggs and they mentioned a few different people yeah. and it was supposed to be at a particular date and then COVID hit so they canceled it and rescheduled it and checked with me on my schedule and I said yes. Then they canceled the rescheduled and then rescheduled that. So I think I was, I was, I wanted to say cast. I think I was hired a, two years before it, it actually oh, wow. happened. And I literally did not know what I was going to at all. It was all a surprise. And I really, really loved it. Yeah, it was, it was a fun event this year. It really was good. They kind of made up for that lost year of COVID and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And they had uh, Coolio and, you know, lots it's of other. It was the Uggs guy, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. And then the guy who invented Pictionary. You know, which uh, is just so, such an eclectic group. It was just a fun thing. Very. Well, how do people find you? I mean, how do they get in touch with you if they want to? know more about you or email you or there's a few ways okay so i personally do all my media posts it's literally my life so at the claudia wells is a facebook fan page which i post on a lot instagram at the claudia wells twitter at the claudia wells so those are how to kind of check in with me on my daily life and i read every single comment that people write every single one if they're mean i delete it but that's very rare and um ClaudiaWells.com is where you can go and, and get autographed pictures sent to you and this t-shirt and all my media stuff is there and my event schedule. Oh, cool. So every time, as soon as I've signed a contract for a, an event, I tell Stephen Clark, who puts it on BackToTheFuture.com, and I tell my webmaster, and it immediately goes. As soon as the contract's signed and they have their ad, it goes on there. So ClaudiaWells.com for event schedule and to buy stuff. ArmaniWells.com is the only way to make an appointment to go into my store. Mm -hmm. If you show up, I'm not there unless you've scheduled an appointment. Got it. And then at the Claudia Wells. That's great. It was so much fun having you here. And um, you and I have actually been talking about doing uh, something more, particularly involving Comic Con and you know those those kind of not Comic Con itself, but those kind of things. And uh, you know we'll be continuing that conversation. So. Pay attention to us, and we're going to let you know. Hopefully, we're going to get Claudia back here and uh, do some fun stuff in the next month or so. Guys, welcome back. We have two special guests today, Dalston Khalili and Lorenzo Antonucci, right? Did I say that right? You said it right, brother. I want to welcome you guys to the show. Thank you for being on Everything Hollywood. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, Thank man. You. I appreciate you guys really excited to talk about your new projects and also talk about you guys individually, you know, your careers. I mean, there's so much going on, you know, as we were getting ready to come on the show, I overheard you guys about all the exciting stuff that is going on. So, um, Dustin, I want to start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about your background to become, you know, obviously you're a celebrated director but that's not an overnight thing, right? It it takes many years for you to get where you are. Um, a lot of our audience members are people that either want to get into the entertainment or they are in the entertainment business. So we would love to hear kind of a little bit about your journey and what led you to be where you are. Um, I was actually a theater dog in the early 90s and very much into stage and performance and acting and enjoying the classics and things of that nature. And then uh, I, I kind of slid into filmmaking. A few friends of mine and I put down a challenge to make a short film. And uh, we shot it and we cut it and I fell in love. And I knew that storytelling and, and this reality was going to be my path. Um, about 15 years later, I did my first feature, Insomnia Manica. Uh, wrote, directed, starred in that one actually, uh, got distribution, and uh, I fell in love with the whole feature game, following uh, doing uh, documentaries, and now this 10th feature of The Way. The thing that I found 
uh, throughout the journey that really kept me going was the desire and the passion to create and express and tell stories, the energy of being on a set, the sense of completion, you know, when there's an idea in your mind and then it comes to fruition and it goes out into the world. You know, these are the things that would continue to motivate me and motivate me um, when it's very difficult because there's a lot of dry time too. There are these desert expanses that you have to kind of go through. And my father would always, uh, God rest his soul, he would quote the famous poet Rumi, blessed is the gambler who has lost everything except the desire to gamble again. And mm -hmm. uh, that passion stayed with me. And so here I am, probably about over 30 years in the game, and now making really cool things and uh, working with cats like Lorenzo, very accomplished uh, performers and talent and um, expanding the vision and deepening the skills. And here we are today. And being a filmmaker today, is it's not enough just to be a director or a writer. You really have to be an entrepreneur, especially in the indie game, because there's so much that has to be considered through the process. So uh, it's been quite a, an arc and a journey thus far, and I'm looking forward to the rest. Wonderful. You brought up a really interesting point to be an entrepreneur, right? Because as an independent artist, you know, we need to actually do everything, right? Raise the funding, you know, do, do everything that involves in the project. So um, how long did it take you from the conception of the way till you were able to really shoot and, and edit. I mean, how long did that process take you? Uh, screenwriting took a little bit over a year once I had the idea solid and flushed it out, you know, eight, nine drafts later. Um, at the same time, once I hit a certain threshold, I started seeking funding. Uh, and that process took about a year to get the financing. And then, of course, COVID hit which really made things interesting because uh, we, we actually shot in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. So we, very yeah. few productions, right, Lorenzo? And that yeah. was, that it was, was so new. It was like, yeah. yo, we're on set. And it's like the world is shut down. It was weird. Everything had to be wiped down every two hours. You know, it's mm -hmm. like constantly tested. Uh, so we went through that particular process. And I have to say the theater background really helped me because I was able to get together with people outside of the set in safe environments and do rehearsals and really dial it all in. And of course, shooting it, cutting it. Uh, the whole process took about three years, uh, Omar. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, from that entrepreneurial standpoint, you get an idea, you make the product, and then you have to sell it. And each of those is quite uh, the leap and the journey. Yes, yes. And Lorenzo, man, you're, you, you've done you know, being an incredible performer and, and just the body of work that you've done. Tell us a little bit about your journey and to get to where you are today, you know. Um, tell us a little bit about your struggles and some of the, the things that you had to overcome to really be where you are today. Yeah, that's an interesting one, Omar, because um, I wasn't, I always wanted to be Stallone and De Niro. You know, I had no idea about acting. I was always a guitar player and I toured the world in a band called Sworn Enemy. We were signed to Electra Records for our first turn, our first record. And that was a major thing for us because we were just a New York hardcore band that got a huge opportunity and was performing for 10 years in the, you know, all over the world, you know probably 50 times in the United States, 25 times in, in Europe, and then just other parts of the, the, the globe. You're talking to a musician, man. Yeah, That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. so nice yeah, to so I that. did that. I did that, and I left the band in 2009. In the summer of 2009, I left the band, and I wanted something different. I didn't want to be a part of um, – a team where they they didn't have the same vision I'm not saying that they didn't i'm just you know i'm just speaking freely i wanted to be i wanted to walk to the beat of my own drum i didn't want to have to you know answer the five other guys and have that you know because there's a lot of baggage that comes with that and that's fine it was a big great lesson to learn and i had the one of the best times of my my 20s and 30s in the band in the in that world cut to 
going into the film and television in 2013 is the first audition I ever did was in April of, I had no idea. And I was, uh, I was came to LA to wrestle. I was trying to become a wrestler and for the WWE and get a tryout. And my friend Joey was my roommate. He was my, also my wrestling partner in some of the classes. And he was like, yo dude, you'd kill it as a, as an actor, you should get your headshots. I was like, what are headshots? What do you mean? I don't even know what you're talking about. So he helped kind of guide me with that. And then I started getting auditions in like late 2013, started doing it in 2014 and shot our first movie. I was a co-writer, um, a co-producer. I was supposed to be a co-writer, but whatever. That turned into, you know, a, a different scenario with the other writer. And, um, and I was one of the lead actors. And um i didn't know what i was doing but i knew i loved it and i had the passion and then from there seeing that turn from you know from conceptually you know from 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 the concept to the actual delivery of the whole movie and then it coming out i fell in love with the business just like Dustin. so i yeah. knew that my hustle was you know going to just just run over everything. I just knew that I I, I was no, nothing was going to stop me after that. Even though there was a lot of ups and downs and financially that's brutal, you know, this town is a tough town to live. It's expensive and you know, when you have a dream, you got to sacrifice it all and I did it and now I'm now I'm I've overcome all that. So here I am, you know, and well, love crazy well, crazy I'm sure here, man. No, that that's an incredible story because I totally understand, man, because, you know, just to pursue your dreams, you know, and, and I tell people, you know, for me, when I came to L.A., it took me exactly 20 years from the day that I came to Los Angeles and from the day that I was at the Staples Center, got a Grammy Award. That uh, that part took 20 years. But, man, that's, 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 you know, what that's what a lot of people don't understand, that, you know, like I'm seeing you guys – and I see the struggle, it's not an overnight thing. It's not an overnight success because you have to just keep grinding and keep grinding, right? So, Dostan, I'm, I'm really interested because, you know, you wear different hats, right? I mean, first of all, being a writer, you know, I, I have so much respect for writers because they're really the ones, because everything starts with a story, right? You could have a Lorenzo who's an incredible actor, but if you don't have a great story, if you don't have a great script, it doesn't mean anything, right? So um, it's like in music, you know, Lorenzo, it's like writing a great melody, right? It's like mm -hmm. when you're writing a great melody, it's all about that. You can add the instruments, you can do all the other stuff, but if you don't have the basic melody, you don't have anything, right? So is that your approach? You look at the story as being the, the, the most important thing um, that, that drives a film? Yes, I mean, you know, if you have a solid story with uh, clarity of theme and clarity of intention, then you really have a great place to begin, mm -hmm. you know, because by the time I get to the place where I'm working with actors and bringing in crew and, and things of that nature, um, it's gone through quite a few iterations and it continues to grow on set. I mean, even in rehearsals, like with Lorenzo, we were discovering and building and, you know, it's always being written. You're, you're writing it when you write the script, you're writing it when you're rehearsing, you're writing it when you're shooting, you're writing it when you're editing. It's this living, organic thing. And if you have a really clear idea, mm -hmm. uh, or in my experience, I, I, I don't move forward until I have real clarity on what I'm about. And then I remain open to discover. Then that really makes all of the challenges and everything that comes along very pleasurable, really enjoyable because I do it to have fun, Omar, really. <laughs> so, right. right, yeah. And I have a good time, and we had a really good time in spite of all, <laughs> in spite of all shooting this movie. So that's what I'm all about. And so when, when you have that foundation, man, you can fly. Yeah. This is a fun business, that's for sure. When it's great and it's going and everything is, you know, hunky-dory, it's fun, man. But when it gets when it gets crazy and it's, it's it, you know, there's a couple of sour patches in there and it's a couple of toxic yeah. people around, oh, the business is brutal. Well, it's, it's uh, such a, you know, like, uh, you, you, you know, we're talking about writing a great story, right? So everything starts with you alone in front of a laptop. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then it kind of grows. Oh, typewriter. Some of the best or, movies. Or, or, or type, okay, or typewriter, or a paper and pencil, or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and for you, for you, it would be a guitar, for me, it would be a piano or whatever you play, yeah. you know. I write, just, no, I write as well. I write, I write as well. So, so, I, so I, I, it, it, it starts with that, and it, so how do you deal, um, just out of curiosity, and, and that goes really for both of you guys, because you really have to collaborate. When you're making a film, you really have to collaborate with so many different types of artists um especially for a director i would say you know because you really have to you have so many departments and so many personalities that you deal with how do you how do you overcome that i mean i don't know i mean we're meeting here uh, virtually for the first time you seem to be really easy going and kind of a cool guy you know but i'm saying are you um is that how you approach directing by just trying to bring everyone together i mean what is your style maybe i should be asking this to asking lorenzo but let me ask you and how you deal with that how do you how do you approach when you're dealing with dozens maybe hundreds of people to make a film well my general philosophy is you know as a director you want to find the best people in every possible position yeah and you come to those artists with maximum clarity of concept because I've spent so much time with it. And I say, this is my vision. This is what I see. Bring me your maximum creativity. I want to hear all the input you've got because it, at that point, it's no longer mine. It becomes ours. And to really get the best out of everybody, it has to be a team effort. Everyone has to bring their best. And to have that trust in me is approaching with a clear idea and then being open and discovering together because that's part of the fun of filmmaking, right? You're bringing all these arts, acting, music, cinematography, and those artists are all specialized in what they do. I want their best because they're going to give to the film far more than I could as an individual if I were you know, very much dictatorial about it. So as long as I'm staying in the lane of the concept, you know, it becomes a discovery process. And, and in my experience, uh, that makes a very successful set and it makes it a lot of fun. Mm, that that makes a lot of sense. And Lorenzo, you know, what would be your advice? I mean, you know, especially for actors that are starting out, um, you know, I talk to a lot of uh, younger actors that want to get into the business, you know, and we get a lot of comments from them. I kind of want to get your advice because you know obviously you're a successful actor you know it's taking you some time to be here but what would you say to younger people that are you know wanting to be in feature films um you know don't get hung up on you need an agent you need a manager you need to go and hustle every day all day 24 7 um, you need to go figure out where, where and how, what production office you can work for, what casting department office you can work for, or what production you can work for and work for free. Work for a PA. If you're going to be a PA, you make your hundred bucks a day. That's actually, you're making a hundred bucks a day. Uh, get there, get free. And that's how you start building connections. And then, you know, you figure out how and what you're good at can apply to getting in front of the you know i mean obviously and working on your craft I and mean, this is this is like you still got to do the work but you're not going to get found in some theater you're not going to get found. i know guys in theater that have been killing it in theater and they're great on stage and they can't even get an audition so that's how brutal it is you got to go and hustle and and grind and 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 suffer because if you don't feel it you you can't you you can't apply any real emotion to who you are when you when you are going to be in on, on on the screen. So you need to go through. The, I, I mean, I don't know. One out of a million people, one out of a hundred thousand, make it just by a fluke. You know, they're just lucky. You know, what I mean, this is a there's some luck, but you got to put the work in. You know, you know, life's like a bank account. You got to put in five dollars to take out five dollars. If you don't put the work in, you ain't gonna get nothing out of it. Yeah, I gotta add to what he's saying, Omar. Yes. Too. Yeah. In the case of Lorenzo himself, uh, from a directorial standpoint and casting people, Lorenzo is a consummate, uh, 
professional. He shows up on time, excellent attitude, knows his work, is humble and ready to do whatever it takes. And when the pressure is applied, he actually transcends because he's done all the work and he has the right attitude. And that I would say is also a very, very important element in success, mm -hmm. definitely in the acting industry and all the other parts in this business. But uh, that, that, that always goes into consideration in the casting process. And when I met Lorenzo in the, in the first 10 minutes, I knew he was my man because of those particular aspects. So right. that's also something to consider. Yeah. I think I think that's an excellent point. You know, I've I've been in situations. I I remember one situation where I had a very well-known violinist um, who's performed with probably some of the top artists in the world. Um, she came to do a, a performance with me, and you know, I hear she's great. This and that. When she showed up, she didn't come in for the rehearsals, or she was an hour late. You know, and the night of the performance, she just couldn't really carry the tune and her violin had some technical issues. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter who you are, you know, you got to be professional. And I completely understand your point And I think it's very important. One thing I want to ask both of you guys is what are your thoughts, um, you know, about something like YouTube, right? Because I had this discussion on Clubhouse with some of my friends um, about creating your own little project. And, I, and I'm not saying go out there and do a feature film like what you guys are doing now. I'm saying if you're a younger person, um, you know, when I started, there was no YouTube back in the early 90s. There was no iTunes. There was, you know, nothing. So we actually had to go out there and perform. But nowadays people have this opportunity right like you could take you could take a little project you could do a little monologue and put it on youtube and mm -hmm. and and if you really if it resonates with people right you can get a following i've seen i don't know if you guys know about this kid um who did this little uh fresh uh uh prince uh Will Smith is um, TV show. What's that called? Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Fresh Prince of Bel Air, right? So he put this little five-minute thing together. This is a young kid, um, and he garnered something like two point five or three million views. And Will Smith actually called him and said, "Listen, I want to do this film, you know." And it was just a complete like one guy, low budget, you know, like in his room or something, right? So what I'm saying is. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I've, I've given people advice saying, look, if you're a performer, perform. Don't wait for you guys to, to uh, cast you in a film. Don't wait for me or anybody. Uh, tell me a little bit uh, your thoughts. I, I, am I going the right direction here talking about yeah, this? Yeah. Or would you, would you say something else here? If you, if you have... I mean, you have, I don't know, 8 billion people that you can touch. It's, I mean, the internet is, 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 is free. YouTube, you can upload anything on there. And if it speaks to, you know, if it's real, the world will feel, right? So, yes, I agree with that. Figure out how to write two pages, three pages. Make a three-minute piece. Figure it out. You know, learn how to do it, you know, and, 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 and then go on your Facebook and do a, a GoFundMe and say, all my friends and family, please share this. I want to raise two thousand dollars so I can go and shoot myself a, a, a little story and, and star in it and direct it and then you know there's so many tools and so many ways to do it on your own where you can show your work and then you have something to show when you say I do this because you already did it you're not talking about something you're doing and um, you know and yes you have to you know with that you got to be humbled and always kind on set and kind to everybody around you and when you're good and you bring positive energy to even the big players around they want you around because they want that good energy everybody wants good energy i don't care if you got one billion one million or a hundred grand everybody wants good energy around nobody wants bad energy so you have to apply all that into the work you know like it's all a part of your personality because you are, you are in control of your character. Your reputation is controlled by others. So if you're out there, you know, doing all this hard work to make this 
piece and you think you're the, you're, you're, you're the best thing since nice uh, sliced bread and you have this awesome piece and now you're showing it around and you're not and you're showing up late because you think you're you're a big shot and you think that this and that, that word spreads and then people don't want to work with you and then you're always you know uh angry and bitter at everybody because nothing's moving yeah you know like, but yeah i would say create your own be a trailblazer create your own way you can write a two-minute piece, man. Learn on you can learn a tutorial on how to write on Final Draft. It's very easy. It's a hundred-dollar program. You can figure it out. It's very simple. It's just, it's just when you want to do something, go do it. Don't, don't talk about it. Be about it. Yes. And Dustin, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, very eloquently put, Lorenzo, and I agree wholly. And ultimately, everything that you create and put out there, every experience you have of going through that process is one more layer, one more notch, one more rung in the ladder, because the depth of experience is gonna be the key when it all comes together, when you're creating projects, when you know, and that experience will then open you up to learning new things and developing more. Uh, so in every way, that creative process, no matter how you're expressing it, uh, benefits. Yeah. Well, I could sit here and talk to you guys all day because you guys are awesome and, and very knowledgeable. And what I like to do now, because we're coming, you know, we're short on time here and we're coming to the end of our program. But what I like to do is ask you guys individually to please share your social media. And also, how can we watch the movie? Is the movie um, out there yet? Or, or, you know, maybe you could tell our audience how we can um, support, you know, your project. Right, so the film is going to be having a uh, limited engagement in Los Angeles from the 12th to the 18th of uh, this month at uh, the Music Hall in Beverly Hills, three shows a day. Uh, you can buy tickets online at uh, LemuriaCinema.com or AllianceOfLight.co or uh, at you know, TheWayMovie.com. And then in Jan on January 4th, it's going to be released digitally everywhere uh, for sale, on demand, VOD, cable, and all of that through Gravitas Ventures. Wonderful. And what about your social media links, if you guys don't mind sharing that? And we'll be right. putting it in the comments below as well. Sure. At Alliance of Light Film and uh, at Daston Khalili. At Lorenzo Antonucci Jr. for Junior. So at Lorenzo Antonucci Jr um and uh my twitter is at real antonucci and facebook is just lorenzo antonucci well gentlemen it's been a, a pleasure speaking with you guys i i think i'm gonna come and watch the movie i have to um yeah we gotta meet we gotta meet the grammy winner man come on let's go. Omar, uh, um, <laughs> you are definitely invited to the premiere on friday night if you are available please join us uh, next week, next Friday. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And what, uh, that sounds exciting. Are you yeah. guys excited? You guys must be so excited. This is like amazing, Great. right? This is, this is like what you, you do it for. <laughs> this, I mean? like, this is it. This is, yeah. 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 Well, wonderful. Thank you very much guys. Thank you so much for watching the show. It's been, it's been amazing, you know, having these two gentlemen on the show, thank please you subscribe. And if you have any comments for these guys or for our show, please put it in the comments below. And we will see you next time. Thank you.